News of the Times, Serial Killer Saturdays, The French Bluebeard, Henri Désiré Landru. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, it is 1919, when the start of trying to piece together Landru's multiple crimes begins. We once again visit France and the horrific case of the aptly named French Bluebeard, Henri Desiree Landru, who was found guilty of murdering ten women he had met via the Lonely Hearts advertisements in the French newspapers in the early 20th century version of Tinder. The story caught the attention of both sides of the channel with reports of his hypnotic eyes riveting the newspaper readership. He was considered a very clever man. We take a look at Landru, his background, his methods of attracting the women, and the crimes he perpetuated. Also, what of the bodies? They were never found. The French bluebeard Henri Landru is this week's episode of Serial Killer Saturdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Henri Désiré Landru, also known as the Blue Beard of Gambay, or the French Blue Beard, was a notorious French serial killer who operated during the early 20th century. He was born on April 12, 1869, in Paris, France. Landru is infamous for his crimes, which involved luring wealthy and vulnerable women through personal ads in newspapers and then murdering them for their money. He was known for his charm and persuasive skills, which he used to gain the trust of his victims. He would then convince these women to visit him at his countryside home where he would ultimately kill them. From the Sunday Post, the 6th of November, 1921. In the beginning of 1919, the police were searching for three women who had disappeared. All three were traced to Gambay, and an engineer named Dupont, occasionally resident there, was suspected in each case. Search was made for Dupont, but in vain until on the 10th of April a certain Mademoiselle Lacoste, the younger sister of Mademoiselle Bouisson, one of the missing women, believed she recognised in a bald and bearded customer coming out of a glassware shop, the premier, whom she had met while he was courting her sister. She informed the police, who immediately proceeded to the shop in question and learned that the customer was called Julien Goulet and was by profession an engineer. They traced him and identified him with Dupont and also with Landru, a man who, since 1900, had been on various occasions tried for fraud and who was then wanted on a charge of that nature. As a matter of fact, he had been searched for in vain for five years. The story continues. From the Constabulary Gazette, Dublin, the 5th of November, 1921, the extraordinary story of the alleged modern Bluebeard. The tenant of the mysterious villa was traced to a flat in the Rue Rocher, a respectable thoroughfare in Montmartre quarter of Paris. He was apparently astounded when, on the April 14th, 1919, the police inspector told him his errand. There must be some extraordinary mistake, he exclaimed. My name is Lucien Goulet, and I am an engineer. While speaking, he made a nervous dive into his pocket with his hand and seemed to be trying to get rid of something which it contained. The inspector at once searched him 
and found a small, commonplace-looking notebook. It is this notebook upon which the prosecution will chiefly rely in the forthcoming trial. It contains this list of eleven names in neat handwriting. Couchet, Cruziatier, Colombe, Juan, André, Havre, Babillier, Marchadier, Brésil, Buisson, and Pascal. When the police came to look into the antecedents of the arrested man, they found that his real name was Henri Desari Landru. He was 51 years old and had four or five times been sentenced in terms of imprisonment ranging from two to four years for fraud. Yet in his younger days, no one could have observed the proprieties more thoroughly than the shy, reserved youth who began life as a choir boy at the church of Saint-Louis del Ile in the heart of Paris. He remained there till he was a young man, being employed as an altar servant, and it was at the church that he made the acquaintance of the first and only woman that this man of many amours ever married. In October 1893, Mademoiselle Remé, who is still living and by whom he had four children. Landru started in business as a small builder and contractor. He invented a primitive model of a motorcycle. He had plans accepted for works at the Collège de France and for a crèche. He lived abstentiously without even the indulgence of smoking and drinking, the very model, it seemed, of the virtuous husband of the petit bourgeois class. But about the year 1900 a sudden change came upon Landru's habits, and thenceforth forward he lived almost exclusively by fraud. In 1902 he was sentenced to two years' imprisonment, in 1906 to five, the latter sentenced being by default. In 1909 and 1910, brought further convictions, and in the latter years he was sent to prison at Luce and remained there for three years. It was only on his release from this last sentence that Landru started his system of matrimonial advertisements. In them, he represented himself as a widow, fond of domestic life, and anxious to settle down. Search at the Gambas Villa after Landru's arrest yielded a miscellany collection of articles which had belonged to women. Among them were many letters, and the writers of all these letters were tracked down by the police, with the exception of those whose names were found in Landru's mysterious little book. These women with whom Landru had been in correspondence and who were still to be traced all agreed in representing him as a most attentive, kind-hearted and gentle-mannered lover. They had replied fully freely to his tactful inquiries as to the extent of their means and their relations with the family. But in the case of each, some little hitch had occurred to prevent the visit to the villas at Gambas, which in every case he had not failed to suggest. He had possession of the property of Madame Couchet, and we find he is quite nicely off for the time, and indeed was on the road to another service very similar to many more to come. Another odd coincidence particularly struck the attention of the police who were investigating the Landru case. 
it was that his cryptic little notebook contained in every case the date on which the ten missing women whose names were found there had been last seen, and in every case also, opposite to this date, was entered the record of having bought one return ticket and one single ticket to Gambais. Moreover, elaborate excavations in the garden of the Gambe villa brought to light a few handfuls of fragments of bone. They were handed over to the surgical experts, and the report which they have now submitted is understood to state that amongst those remains are fragments of the bones of several animals, but that certain minute splinters appear to be of human origin and have belonged to three different skeletons. The story gripped both sides of the channel. Landru, clearly a very clever man, managed to withstand the questioning of some of France's best detectives and interrogation. Stories were recounted in detail of his dry wit, and people questioned how such an ordinary-looking man could have attracted so many women. He had been successfully corresponding with over 250 women. From Reynolds Newspapers, the 6th of November, 1921, Henry Landru. The literature of murders and mysterious crime is full of examples from France, for somehow or other the most arresting stories seem to come from that land. But never... Even in the history of French criminal mysteries can there have been a more remarkable trial than that which will open on Monday at the Assizes of the Seine, when Henri Landru will face the judge and jury charged with a series of murders which, for the last couple of years, have been the centre of interest not only in France, but to a lesser degree in every land where men and women read newspapers. Already the central figure has become something of a legend, a combination of Bluebeard and Don Juan. Newspapers and current gossip have been full of clever things he has said or is supposed to have said. Almost every caricaturist has tried to pencil on such a fascinating subject the series of crimes with which he is charged would show him, if he is guilty, to be an ogre, one of the most dangerous criminals in the history of the world. Charged with eleven murders. Landru is charged with having murdered no fewer than eleven persons, ten women and a young man. In very few circumstances, has there been such a mass of circumstantial evidence? And yet it may be said that there is no absolute proof. Of all the eleven victims, nobody has succeeded in finding or tracing the body of a single one. The prosecution suggests a simple explanation. If the bodies of the victims have not been found, they say, it is because Landru has burned them. But all who have studied criminal literature know how many difficulties there are in the ways of burning a body so as to leave no trace. Landru has an explanation even more simple. If he have not found all the women I have known, is his retort, it is because you have not sought carefully enough. This, doubtless, will be the line of reasoning adopted by Landru's counsel, Maitre de Mongiaferi. Nearly three hundred women to this the prosecution has a deadly counter-thrust. 
they have the names of 253 women with whom Landru has been in correspondence or with whom he has had relations. All of them have been discovered, excepting only eleven. Not one of these who have been found has been robbed by Landru. On the other hand, there seems to be abundant proof that every one of those who have disappeared has been despoiled of her goods, robbed to the last half penny, to the tiniest trinket she had in her possession. Let me briefly sketch the things with which this man is charged. It was in February 1919 that the young chambermaid by the name of Mademoiselle Lacoste wrote to the police authorities about the disappearance of her sister, Madame Bousson, of whom she had heard nothing for eighteen months. She was afraid there had been foul play. Her sister, it appeared, had been engaged to an engineer named Georges Fremiette, whom Mademoiselle Lacoste had never liked. More than this, she had learned that another friend of Fremier, a uh, Madame Colombe, had also disappeared a year or so before Madame Bousson. Search had been made, but in vain. It was known that both women had gone to live with Fremier in a house in Gambès, and beyond that there was not the faintest trace of them. Curiously enough, the mayor of Gambès declared that no engineer of the name of Fremier was known in the little town. An official inquiry was instituted, and the conclusion was come to that the women had been murdered. The next task was to find the so-called Fremier. Chance came to the assistance of the police. One day, while walking in town, a friend of Madame Bousson came face to face with Fremier. By this time, he had changed his name to Lucien Goulet. He was still, however, an engineer. As a matter of fact, he was no more Lucien Goulet than Fremier, nor Dupont, nor Barbizius names which he had used successfully, nor was he always an engineer. He proved to be an old fraudster whom the police had been looking for. He had already been six times sentenced for robbery. How, in all these years of war, he had been able to elude the police is a mystery for the police had been extra keen after deserters. How had he lived? Where did he get his money? Mystery. A man of method. He had carried on his robberies with skill, getting his dupes through the matrimonial columns of the newspapers. In his house, many documents were found, for he was a man of scrupulous method. It was found that partly by means of advertisements, partly by chance encounters in the street, he had been in correspondence with 283 women. But there was one document that was found in his papers which was of the greatest importance. There were on this paper 11 names, 10 of women and one of a young man, and among those eleven were found the names of the two missing women, Madame Bousson and Madame Colombe. The police set to work and gradually discovered that every name on this private list was of a person who had disappeared, and every one, say the authorities, had been robbed by Landru. When the examination took place before the magistrates, it was revealed that Landru had a garage in Clichy in the name of Fremiette. In this garage, 
Landru had amassed an amazing amount of things. Furniture, clothes, papers, etc., all belonging to the women he had known and who had disappeared, leaving no trace from the moment they had gone to Landru. He had another garage wherein were found the same kind of things. He was discovered, too, that he was married and that he had a son living in Clichy. So many crimes in two years. It was incredible. They were all exactly alike. Disappearance of the victim, robbery of her goods, always in exactly the same manner. Such was the case against Landru, which took over the headlines of all the papers. No bodies were ever found, further complicating the case against Landru. From the Sunday Post on the 6th of November 1921. The evidence brought from Paris in a hearse, made up in packages of varying shapes and sizes, all sealed imposingly with the official seals. They arrived only the other day, carried from Paris in a public hearse, drawn by two black horses. The conveyance was appropriately enough, however, for prominent in this lot of exhibits are a coffin-shaped box of indeterminate bones from Gambais, and four boxes of 16 inches by 12 inches containing bones identified as human. Other exhibits in which a part of the legal battle will rage are the famous notebooks, containing, as one detective grimly phrased it, the official list of the victims. The annals of justice contain very few cases which can parallel that in which this bearded man of 52, with his subtly attractive personality, ingratiating manners and hypnotic eyes, is the central figure. Many women have been conquered by the charm and forcefulness of this truly remarkable man, and the majority of cases have, soon after their surrender, vanished forever from humankind. They have gone to his lonely villa at Gambais with the man they loved and have never been seen or heard again. It is alleged that Landru had made a speciality of matrimonial advertisements and corresponded at one time or another with hundreds of women, selecting his victims very carefully from among the most wealthy and the least suspicious of those with whom he got in touch. Afterwards, when he had obtained control of their money, they were heard of no more. When at last Landru was arrested, having been identified as the man wanted in one disappearance case, a notebook was found in his possession which contained the names of a number of women, all of whom had vanished. The missing women and the dates connected with them are as follows. April 1915. J. and A. C otherwise known as Madame Cruchet, a good-looking widow who, with her sons André, went to Bluebeard's house, taking her savings of over a thousand pounds. June 1915. Madame Thérèse Ladobelin, ni Theron, entered into Landru's diary as Brazil who was promised marriage and then disappeared. August 1915, Madame Goulin, widow of middle-aged, who had about £700 in her possession. October 1915, Madame Berthe Anna Heron, an elderly widow who disappeared just about the time that her marriage to Landru was announced. 
December the 26th, 1916, a woman named Colombe, a bank clerk, who on this date went to Gambas with over three hundred pounds in her possession. March 1917, Madame André Babelier, 22, a fortune teller's assistant who lived with Landru as his niece. September 1917, Madame Bouisson, who went to Gambès with £600. January 1918, Madame Jean, aged 42, who wrote that the Gambès villa was a melancholy place and that her fiancé was a maniac who made her gather leaves for what she knew not. April 1918, Madame Pascal, who went to Gambais with her cat. January 13th, 1919, Madame Machadier, who had £200, took three dogs to Gambais, whose bodies have been found. The problem arose of no bodies being found. It was believed that after their death, he would dismember their bodies and burn the remains in his stove or incinerator. From the Sunday Post on the 6th of November 1921, The House of Mystery After the arrest of the police at once swooped down on his lonely villa at Gambais, on the skirts of the forest of Ramboulet. The house is a small one-story building with a big loft, an outhouse communicating with the kitchen and a cellar below. Its windows look out over the garden to desolate countryside. In one far corner of the grounds is another outhouse. The searchers found two of the living rooms bare. In the two apparently in use were camp bedsteads and dressing tables. The villa had clearly not been a place of luxury. Terrible suspicions hung around that lonely house, however. Had Landru lured to it and there murdered the women who had disappeared and whose names were in his notebook? In some parts of the villa in the coach house, particularly, they found cinders, ashes, bones, buttons and mysterious odds and ends, a garter buckle. As soon as news of the arrest and charges against Landru were made public, neighbours and others came forward with strange, grim stories. Persons who had been out late at night related that even during the hot summer months they had seen its little windows blazing in sinister fashion in the darkness, as if the place had been filled with roaring fire. Others declared that beside the sombre water of two large pools in the neighbourhood, they had at times, after dusk, been startled by sudden splashes and seen the figure of a man gliding away. Landru was held on remand at prison. It took the police and prosecution nearly two years to build up their case against Landru. From the Sunday Post on the 6th of November 1921, building up the case, the French authorities satisfied that the presumptive evidence against their prisoner was sufficiently strong to justify their action that kept him in custody. All the resources at the command of the police were enlisted to make the case against him complete. Slowly, the list of supposed victims were added to, but always the evidence against Landru remained largely circumstantial. It was next subjected to a long series of preliminary examinations in which he faced one of the cleverest examining magistrates in France, Monsieur Bonny. These preliminary 
examinations are something on the same lines as the third degree in America. Their object is to elicit a confession, or, failing that, to trap the accused man into some damaging admission. But Landru's mind was subtle enough and strong enough to successfully pass through this ordeal. Day after day, while the examinations went on, his verbal duels with Monsieur Bonny were the talk of Paris. On the boulevards and in the cafés, the ghastly crimes of which he was accused were almost forgotten in admiration of his cleverness. You look as if some secret weighed upon your conscience, Monsieur Bonny said suddenly to him one day. Confide in me. What is it? Monsieur le juge, sighed Landru. I am heartbroken. This scandal, how will my wife again esteem me as the model husband she once regarded me? I swear that I am innocent, he declared over and over during his examinations. Asked as to the names in his notebook, a piece of evidence the Paris police regarded as particularly significant, he merely shrugged his shoulders. It is true that I knew them, he said, but, messieurs, why ask me what has become of them? How should I know? I am far too polite to be inquisitive respecting the private life of the ladies I meet. Referring to the bones found in his coach house at Gambais, the analysis had not proved that the bones are human, he declared, and the evidence is not sufficient to try me. The authorities, however, think otherwise, and Landru is to be brought to trial. He will probably defend himself very much on the lines of one of his replies to Bonny. You ask, where are these ten women? I ask you, if you, with all the resources of the police, at your call, cannot find them. How can I? Eventually, as much evidence was gathered as possible, including a parade of witnesses, and Landru was put on trial. From the Sunday Post, the 6th of November, 1921. Setting the stage for Landru's trial tomorrow. Tomorrow, after a period of almost two and a half years' imprisonment awaiting trial, Landru known as the modern Bluebeard, appears before a jury of his countrymen on the charges of having made away with a number of women who disappeared after going to his villa at Gambais. His trial to take place in the assizes in the Palace de Justice at Versailles. The courtroom is a famous one, but extremely small, and it is very questionable whether any of the curious sightseers who throng to Versailles will be able to obtain admission. The new session of Assizes opened on Thursday, and it is expected that by far the greater part of it will be occupied by the Landru trial. A large number of witnesses will be called while the papers and exhibits run into thousands. Already they are being accumulated in the halls of the Palace of Justice, so as to be ready when wanted by the prosecution. So many and so varied are the articles that the Palace has taken on, for the time being, at least the aspect of a great second-hand emporium. What was commented upon and over and over was Landru's absolute mastery of himself. He managed to avoid all verbal traps set for him. His attitude remained calm throughout. From the Western Times on the 2nd of December 1921, the Times correspondent describing the prisoner says, No murderer was ever so dramatic and audacious in the dock. Chivalry, mockery, Humility, humour, sarcasm, equanimity, these were the words used to describe his demeanour. 
there was an artistry of villainy in his conduct. Breathlessly, the papers and the public waited for the verdict. The jury, after a laborious prosecution, all heavily drawn on circumstantial evidence, found Landrieu guilty, but paradoxically requested mercy for him. From the Western Times, the 2nd of December, 1921, defiant Landrieu wants neither pity nor mercy, the jury's recommendation. Versailles, Thursday. Landrieu, found guilty of murder yesterday, now occupies the condemned cell. The grating in the middle of the door is always open, and a warder is always watching to guard against attempted suicide. When taken into his cell last night, Landrieu dropped on to the stool and said to the warder, It was time the trial ended. I am terribly tired. The physical and mental staying power of the man of mystery has been amazing. During the closing scenes in court, Maitre Moreau Giaffery was far more affected than the accused when the judges were deliberating on the sentence. After the verdict of the jury, Landrieu said to his counsel with a smile, Now the condemned has to console the counsel. Spectators became increasingly shameless as the trial approached an end and were openly eating, drinking, chattering and jumping on the benches. Some protested being a guard of soldiers brought into court obstructed their view. The outbursts of the public prosecutor who called them cowards and blackguards was more than justified. Maitre Moreau Giaffery wanted Landrieu to sign a petition of, for mercy. Landrieu refused, saying, I will sign a petition of appeal, not mercy. I want neither mercy nor pity. Afterwards, he assured his counsel he would sleep as calmly tonight as other nights. The jury's petition for mercy to the President of the Republic after it had declared guilty of 46 counts out of 48, is generally regarded as the most paradoxical the sentence pronounced by the President, prescribed that Landrieu should be taken into an open space at Versailles and have his head cut off. Landrieu, standing erect, listened with absolute sangfroid adopting a respectful but slightly theatrical attitude. After hearing the sentence, he said, I have only one word to say. The court is mistaken. I am not guilty of murder. This is my last protest. Then, bending towards Maître Moreau Giaffari, he remarked, If I could have been saved, it would have been by you. Landrieu previously declared in the name of my love for family and home the only decent sentiment which the prosecution allows me. I affirm I have killed no one. During the last day of the trial, Landrieu gazed at women struggling for seats and was heard to remark, If any of those ladies would like my place, I will very willingly give it up to them. Henri Desari Landrieu maintained his innocence throughout the trial, claiming that the women had all left him voluntarily. Nevertheless, he was found guilty, and his execution by guillotine followed in 1922. From the Yorkshire Evening Post on the 25th of February 1922, Exit Bluebeard. The curtain fell on the last act of a strange drama this morning, when Henri Desari Landrieu, better known as the French Bluebeard, was guillotined. The crime for which he has now paid the penalty was sordid enough. Crimes usually are, and it is its nature it was not uncommon. Many men have murdered a wife of whom they have tired, whose death they had thought to acquire riches, 
but the extraordinary thing about Landrieu's crime was the magnitude and the calculating brutality of it. Whether the full tale of his victims is known even yet may be doubtful, but it is fairly certain that at least ten women whom he had either married or duped into believing that he was about to marry them were done to death by him at various times. They were lured to a lonely house in the country and then murdered for the sake of their money. The analogy with the old nursery tale is far from perfect, but it is close enough to justify the soubriquet which Landrieu became known. The man himself was as extraordinary as his crime. He must, to begin with, have had an unusual power of fascinating women. Those of whom he murdered were but a few of those with whom he seems to have established amatory relations of some sort under one alias or another. The total has been put at 283. Bluebeard himself never came within a mile of that. Then there is the extraordinary cunning with which he concealed traces of his crime. The skill with which he did it is shown by the extreme difficulty the police had in bringing the crime home to him, that even more than the law's delays is responsible for the fact that, though he was arrested as far back as April 1919, he has only just paid the extreme penalty. Most extraordinary of all, however, was the imperturbability with which he stood at his trial. Judge and counsel alike tried in vain to make him commit himself to some damaging statement. He even indulged at times in cynical humour at the expense of the prosecution. Thus, there was something monstrous about him, calculated to make us thankful that such men are rare. It is good that it is so. For the credit of human nature, the world is well rid of such as he. His case remains one of the most famous and chilling criminal stories in French history. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays, The French Bluebeard, Henri Landru. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers, and with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are serial killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in-depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrages, organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. And Fridays are frightful, where we pull together several stories with a similar theme. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.